I had the privilege of going to Washington, D.C. Uh, last year with a group of pastors and got to sit and talk with the Speaker of the House uh, in his official office at the, in the rotunda, just off the rotunda of the Capitol building. Uh, and it was really an amazing day. I got to talk about issues of life um, for our country. Uh, and it was a, a, a unique experience. I've been to the, I've been to Washington, D.C. before, visit with the, our family, and I've never gotten some of the inside access that I had at that time. And, and I shared the story back then, but we got kicked out of the Capitol building, us group of pastors, uh, because we had, we'd met a gentleman and we ate breakfast in the, in the uh, representative's dining hall downstairs. It was amazing. The people that were in that room, it was just an experience I'd never had before. I got to meet an old uh, um, governor from South Carolina that was governor while I lived down there. Um, anyway, just a unique experience. Well, the gentleman we met for breakfast uh, walked us out and was going to show us around. When he got a call, he had to go to a meeting. And so he, he told one of the guys with us, he says, uh, why don't you take him up and show him the chapel? Now, this guy wasn't working in D.C. He was just with our group, but he used to live there. He says, go show him the chapel. And he says, can we do that? And he says, yeah, just go up the steps, you know, through the rotunda, and it's, and it's right there. And so we walk up the steps, a group of uh, ten pastors and this gentleman, and we're walking around the rotunda of the Capitol building, and there's all these cordoned off areas and, and uh, tour guides leading people through tours, and we're just walking around. <laughs> we had suits on, so we kind of looked like we were supposed to be there, right? And finally, we couldn't, we couldn't find the chapel, so we asked one of the security guards, a very large fellow, by the way, where's the chapel at? <clears throat> and he says, uh, it's down the hall and to the left, but why are you asking? What are you doing here? And so we told him we're a group of pastors, and we met with so-and-so, and we got a meeting today with John Boehner, and da-da-da-da, and we went through the whole thing. He says, who are you up here with? Us, they were just strolling around the Capitol. He says, you can't do that. We just did. <laughs> and uh, he didn't look happy. I wasn't sure if he was going to beat us to the ground, which he probably could have done very easily. Uh, or what? He's, and, he, and we explained to him, we, we gave him the combination to the door. We had the, combina we had the secret code. We knew the handshake, you know. And... And so when he knew we had the code, we probably were who we said we were, and that we had talked to who we said we talked to. And he calls somebody. He says, you know, they're up here, they're just walking around. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm going to take them to the chapel. So he takes us to the chapel, and, you know, if you've ever been in the Capitol, it's an incredible building. And, you know, stone, everything, and grand halls. And so I just, I was excited to see the chapel. And we push the combination on the door, and he says... Do you want to see it or you want to go in and have prayer? I, and we said, we'd love to just go in and spend a few minutes and pray in the chapel. So he opens the door and lets us in, and I'm expecting, ta-da! Walk in, it's about the size of a normal coat closet. It was small. I've told you, some of you have been around, told you the story. It was about this big. Eleven of us pretty much filled the room. Highly disappointed. And maybe part of the problem with our country. Uh, broken. Absolutely broken over that. That in such a massive, beautiful building, the chapel was so small. And my guess is not, very, not used very much either. I share this story to, to kind of lead us into where we're going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, about who we need to be as a people. We're, we're in the book of Luke. We're going to look at chapter 12 here in just a minute. But I, I love history. I love how things, uh, to learn about how things were founded. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people argue that our country is not a Christian country. Now, not every one of our founding fathers was a Christian. Some were deists, some were congregationalists, and different forms of it. But all of them believed, for the most part, almost all of them believed that the Word of God was the Word of God. And, and most, most of our laws, most of the Declaration of Independence, basically was a list of sermons that preachers had been preaching for years about our rights as a people. And, 
and that the, the First Continental Congress was just steeped in the Word of God and in prayer. In fact, I, the First Continental Congress was September 7, 1774. Was that right, Larry? You were, you were <laughs> secretary. See, I keep picking on him, and, and Don's right back there, and Don's older, but it's just a lot more fun to do it to Larry. <laughs> September 7, 1774, the First Continental Congress meets. Now, this is before, you know, the war would start and all that, but they're, they're meeting, and the, the things are churning in our country. And, they, and if you go back and read the official records of that First Continental Congress, you'll read it, and it says it started with prayer. And so you think, well, you know... Congress starts with prayer now, by the way. In fact, I got to pray on the floor of the house. If you ever watch on TV, I was sitting second row back in the first chair next to the aisle on the right-hand side. That's where I sat, and I pushed the buttons to vote just because they were there in front of me. I'm not sure what I voted for, but I made my, you know. So I, we got to pray on the, the floor of the house. It was really a surreal moment. It really was to know that all the things that have taken place there. Uh, but the, this first one, it says they had prayer. And if you just go on reading, you think, well, you know, okay, they started prayer. You come to find out in the reading, the first Continental Congress, the first time they met as a group of leaders, you know, Jefferson, John Adams, all these guys, George Washington, all this stuff going on, they prayed for two hours. The first prayer that started the Congress was two hours long they prayed. We don't even do that in church. They prayed for two hours as a group of men. Show the picture, if you would. This is a painting of the prayer service of the First Continental Congress, September 7, 1774. And as you can see, there are men everywhere on their knees praying to God. During that two-hour prayer service and during that time they were together, they also, as a Congress, studied four chapters of the Bible. So they had Bible study over four separate chapters. And one guy particularly tells a little more about it. John Adams, if you'll bring the circle in here. That's John Adams right there. John Adams would write to his wife Abigail about this experience of the First Continental Congress, about the prayer time being two hours long and the four chapters of the Bible he studied. And he said, you will not believe what God spoke to us as we study the word, particularly Psalm 35. Now, don't read it right now because we've got other things to talk about. But I want you to write down somewhere, or stick your bulletin in Psalm 35 right now, and read it later, please. Read Psalm 35 from the mindset of the First Continental Congress as they're getting ready to declare war on England. All right? And he says, it's amazing what God spoke to us as we studied his word. And so the First Continental Congress spent two hours in prayer and studied four chapters of the Bible. Sounds like Congress now, doesn't it? <laughs> Both sides of the aisle, there are Christians and there are believers, but that kind of calling out to God just doesn't happen. And so they start the Continental Congress this way, two hours of prayer, four, four chapters in the Word they study together, and it's about six to eight weeks later the John Adams, who was the second president of the United States, he died at 90 years old. Do you know what day he died on? Guess. July 4th. He died on July 4th. Now that's timing, right? Anyway, John Adams, six to eight weeks later after this prayer time in his first Congress, he writes to his wife Abigail. And he says, you would not believe what is happening. And he begins to recount to her all the victories that they were having in their fight against uh, England. Now remember, we had no army. Our army was the British army because up until this point, we were British citizens, right? So we, we did not have our own army. Our army was them. And it was one of the best armies in the world. And as they began this process of breaking away from England, they were trying to develop an army. And so basically they're telling, you know, uh, farmers and teachers and, uh, whatever your profession to go home, get your squirrel gun off the top of the mantle, and we're going to build an army to fight against England for our freedom. And so you think farmers with squirrel guns facing the most formidable 
uh, army in the world, and Adams writes, we're winning everywhere. He also wrote, he told Abigail, he says, we have already captured a 64-gun man of war, which is a boat, and a 20-gun man of war. We have captured two of the Navy ships from Britain. And what's amazing about that is we don't even have a Navy yet. But we started collecting one. And so he, he writes these things to Abigail, and it is after this hours and time to prayer, and uh, they also called for a fast. On this day, they called for a continental fast, which would be one of 15, that the whole continent of America would fast and pray for God's provision for our country. It was one of 15 national calls to prayer and fasting. In fact, this group was so committed to prayer that by 1815, there were already 1,400 government proclamations asking for our country as a nation to pray for the events that were surrounding us. Now, were all of them Christians? No. But they believed in the power of prayer and that the word of God was our source. And so he writes to her and says, we are, we're taking ships and we don't even have a navy. We're winning battles and we don't have an army. And he writes to her his conclusion. He says, it is evident to me that the Son of God is powerfully working against the, the nation of Britain. There's no other explanation than that God is at work. And of course we know where it all ends up. Here we sit in freedom all these years later. You can go on from that slide. But notice the men on their knees. Politics have been interesting this year, haven't they? <laughs> Our nation is in an interesting place. You know, and it's, and it's the nature of us to worry and fret we like this one, we don't like that one, we hope this one makes it, hope that one doesn't make it, we hope none of them make it, whatever, what, whatever your, your view may be. And we worry about that. And we wish both sides of the aisle and everyone who holds an office would spend two hours in prayer and time in the Word of God asking for wisdom. We want that. And so our nature is to worry and fret about things that are yet to come. And yet I think we find today in Luke chapter 12 a different call for us as people, and it's not to worry and not to be anxious. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 12, I'm going to give you a brief summary of chapter 11 as you get to Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 11, at the end of, those cha at the end of that chapter, Jesus is, is discussing um, with uh, the Pharisees and the scribes and the followers and all that, that this generation was missing the Son of God, the Messiah. He said, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are going to rise up against and judge you on the day of judgment because you missed uh, someone greater than Solomon here. The queen of the south who came to listen to Solomon will rise up on the day of judgment and judge you because someone who is greater than Solomon is here, talking about himself. He says, your generation uh, will be responsible for the death of all the prophets because... He didn't say it all right, but you're going to kill me and this generation because they missed the time of their coming and they are unrepentant. They will be held responsible for the death of every prophet throughout the ages. It's a very strong condemnation from Jesus Christ to the religious leaders of the day that they were not a repentant people, that they were not on their knees before God. And so he's telling them that they need to turn around and listen to God, which is what our country needs to do. We have redefined everything. We've redefined marriage, we've redefined male and female, we've redefined all things outside of, of God's word. And the solution is not the right politician. The solution is God's people to spend time in prayer, to turn from their wicked ways, to see God, and ask him to heal our land. We need to start ground up and hope that the heart's and be praying for our leaders. The scriptures tells us that it's something we need to do for all our leaders, all of them. The ones we like and the ones we don't. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for them. And not the kind of prayer that says, Lord, may their brakes fail, or something like that. We need to pray that their hearts will be broken before our God. We need to pray for our nation. That's what we need now. God is in control. He really is. 
Even in this political season right now, he's in control. He's not up there going, oh, what do I do? What do I do? Can I fix his hair? And God's, God's not... <laughs> you don't know who I'm talking about. It could be John Boehner's hair. God's not worried. He is not worried. We should not be worried. And, but Jesus has just spoken so hard against the people that they were unrepentant, that they were not seeing God, that they missed what they were supposed to do in their time. And look at chapter 12, verse 1. He says this, Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So it says, under these circumstances, and one of the circumstances... Again, I've got to go quick here. Chapter 11, verse 34 says, The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is also full of darkness. It's going to say, and if, and if you're letting darkness in as your light, how dark you must be. I think that's where our country is in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. And so he says, it's under these circumstances... He says that thousands of people were gathered, and so he began to say to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy, he talks about which is when they put the mask on, they look to be one way and they're doing something else. We don't have time to get into that. But then he says, verse 4, do not be afraid of those who kill the body after that have no more they can do. But I warn you, fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell or Gehenna, lake of fire. I tell you, fear him. And so there seems to be this, this weight of heaviness. He's, he's condemning them that they're missing their time, that they were unrepentant, and that some of the most horrible people in the past on the Day of Judgment would rise up and condemn this generation. And we think, okay, that's bad enough. And then he says, no, you need to fear him who, after he kills, has a body to th ability to throw into the lake of fire into Gehenna. And we think, man, we don't have, a, we don't have an option. But look where it starts to turn which Jesus always turns to hope. Verse 6 of chapter 12. He says, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Just think about that for a minute. There is not a sparrow on the planet that God doesn't know specifically. That's a lot of sparrows. The, every mosquito, if you want, could... God would know each one. Cats, he doesn't care about those. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All you cat lovers, don't throw books at me. It says every sparrow. Another place, Jesus said, that is not one sparrow anywhere in the world can fall out of a tree that God doesn't know it. And so he just got done saying we need to fear him who can destroy us for good is what he means. But then he says, I want you to understand something though. He knows you and what's going on. And then he says uh, in verse 7, Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Not that he knows how many hairs we have on our head, but he has them numbered. This is the third and last one right there. That's number three. You know, you think how many hairs you have in your head. It's not that he knows how many you have. They're numbered. We think, well, that's just a cue. But he, he can, if, if, it's, if it is just an illustration, he could know them numbered and have them numbered. And he says, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Isn't that good news? You think, well, I don't know if I want him to know me that well. <laughs> but his grace comes. And so in the midst of this, he says, under these circumstances, he began to tell him these things. God knows your situation. And jump with me, if you will. Um, let's run short. Let's jump to verse 22. Verse 22 of, of Luke 12. He says to his disciples, for this reason, all these things that we've been talking about, for this reason, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider with me, he says, the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storerooms nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable 
you are than these birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If you then cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? It's a good question, isn't it? We are very talented at worrying. Whether it's in the political realm, or in our financial realm, or our homes, or families. He says, God knows what you think nobody knows. And sometimes you're, someone's here this morning thinking, I don't know if God really knows what's going on in my heart, how broken I am, how afraid I am, how uh, crushed I feel. He does. That's the message for you today. Not a sparrow falls out of a tree. He doesn't know it. He does know your heart. And when he says, I know your heart, and because I know your heart, he says, I want you to understand and not be anxious about anything. Don't worry. You can't even add an hour to your life by worrying. In fact, I suggest you probably take an hour off by doing so. He says, if you can't even do that, why worry about other matters? He says, verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothe himself like one of these. The lilies are more impressive than Solomon. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? Just stop there with me. When I read that verse, I think about it. How many flowers sprout, bloom, show their beauty, and then die, and no human eye ever sees them? I'd say most. I'd say most. How many fields out in forests and, and glades and all over bloom and, and show the field to be beautiful and no human eye ever enjoys their beauty? God is clothing fields and forests with beautiful things that no one ever sees and no one will ever see. And he says, if he does that, when it has no benefit to humankind, if he, if he does it just to do it, he says, but if God so clothes, verse 28, the grass field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? You meant a little faith. And so here's his response. I think here's our response as a nation on July 4th as we think about who we used to be as a country and where we are today. What do we do about it? He says, and do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink. And do not keep worrying. Oh, but man, we like it. Right? He says, don't keep worrying. For all these things, the nations, look at that. The nations of the world eagerly seek. But your father knows you need these things. But seek first his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes or no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, that will where your heart be also. He says in the midst of all this unrepentant, and all this situation, all these troubles, and all your worries, he says, here's what you do about it. Here's what we do about it as a nation. Here's what we do about it as an individual. Here's what we do about it as, as a home or as a business. Seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. As we wring our hands wondering what we should do in this current culture that we live in, I think the word of God to us today is to do what our first Congress did, and that's seek God through his word and through prayer. And trust that if he takes care of the fields that no one ever sees, he will take care of you and us as a nation. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their prayers and I will heal their land. I don't know where our country ends up and it's scope of prophecy and the things have yet to come, but I know where his church ends up, with or without the United States of America. But that's what we need to do. We need to be on our face before the Lord, 
seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and let him add the things that need to be added. We don't have time to, to finish the section, but if you read 35 on, he says you need to be ready. You need to keep your lamps lit because you don't know what hour the bridegroom is coming back to his castle. The bridegroom would go have dinner with his friends. He would go pick up his bride. They would have the ceremony, and then they would come back to his home. And he says, blessed is the servant who is ready to open the door when he gets there, whether it's the first watch, which is from um, uh, 9 to midnight, or whether it's the second watch from midnight to 3 in the morning, that the servant is standing there waiting for the door to open it to, and ready for the, the bridegroom to come home. Of course, he's talking about himself coming back. You ever been surprised at your house, someone knocks on the door, and you're not quite ready to receive gifts? It's a real quick funny story. Uh, since it's, we're talking about politics a little bit today and elections and all that, on election day, I think it was back in uh, March whenever we had the special election, uh, we were babysitting uh, my sister-in-law's dog. And so we'd opened the front door of the church building there in Lawrenceville where we live now, and we'd left it open so the dog could come back in. And it was like 7 in the morning. We are getting ready for school and all that. And the front porch light was on. I was in my robe, thank goodness. And uh, I was in the kitchen making lunches, and some woman walks in the door and sees me standing there in my robe and just got this very strange look on her face. Is this where we vote? <laughs> yeah, we're real casual here in German Township. <laughs> Belly up to the bar and vote. Um, I said, no. That's down the street on the right. This is an old church and now a house. It's at the fire. Okay. I wasn't ready for someone to come to my door that morning. We don't leave it open and the light on the porch anymore. This, we are not Motel 6. We will not leave the light on. <laughs> and so Jesus' call is two things. Quit worrying and be ready. Quit worrying and be ready. You watch the news, you worry. Jesus says stop that. Just be ready. And we're ready by pursuing God first in his kingdom and his righteousness and let him add the other stuff. And we are watching, waiting, knowing the word of God so that we see the times that are coming and we're ready to open the door and, and welcome him back. Quit worrying and be ready. That's what the church is called to do in times like this. Not to worry. You do what you can. I went to Washington for a purpose. To be there and to do what I could to maybe help change the conversation a little bit. But my hope is not in the uh, Speaker of the House or the President or the Senate or the Congress or local leaders here. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness and his kingdom that's coming. And that's our job as the church on this July 4th weekend is to remember that our role is to stop worrying and be ready through prayer and through his word. If Julie would come up, we're going, to, we're going to close this morning. We're going to sing the song, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. It's a very graphic hymn. Uh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And, and it seems dark, but it's, just, it's the truth of what we're doing here today, that Jesus came and he died so that the kingdom could come, that the Father is gladly giving to us. And it's our job to seek that above everything else. So we're going to sing three verses of this beautiful hymn, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. And let's stand and sing it together. And we're going to dismiss you afterwards. And if you're ready to give your life to Christ, as Larry and my dad both said in communion, it would be a good day today to give your life to the Lord. And you can do that by coming forward as we sing. Father, we thank you for the redeeming love of Jesus Christ and the work of the cross we celebrate here today at this table. Father, I do pray for our nation. I pray for our leaders, for those running for office, for those who are in office, Lord, those considering. Father, that everyone's heart will be just drawn to you, that they will open their hearts to seek you uh, with prayer and also open your word. And Father, as a nation, I pray for all the people. Lord, that First Continental Congress that called for a fast, it's only three million people then. Lord, may we as a nation just seek you that a, a spirit revival will break out among our nation, that we will search you for you with all our hearts. 
Lord, help us to turn back to you and, and find healing in our land. Lord, we thank you for those who served our country and brought us the freedom we have today. Lord, bless those who are in harm's way right now and those who are heading that way. Keep them safe. Bring Jesus back so all war will end. Lord, we ask this in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen.